We are blessed today to have uh, Tanajan Suchat Apichato join us um, for our Clear Mountain Monastery conversation this morning. I'll read a short biography of Tanajan, and then uh, Tanisabo and I will begin asking questions. So Tanajan Suchat Apichato uh, is one of the most globally well-known and well-respected monks in Thailand. Born in 1947 in Supanburi, Thailand, Pra Ajahn Suchat attended California State University, Fresno, where he studied civil engineering. After returning to Thailand, Pra Ajahn was inspired by an English Dhamma book on impermanence to search for a true path to happiness through formal ordination as a Buddhist monk. At the age of 27, he was ordained at Wat Bawon in Bangkok with the late Supreme Patriarch as his preceptor, about six weeks after ordination, Pra Ajahn Suchat traveled to Wat Pa Van Dad to live and train with Longta Mahabua, Nyana Sampano, the preeminent forest meditation monk at that time. Once there, he stayed there for the next nine years. After his time at Wat Van Dad, and after staying in Pattaya for some time, Pra Ajahn Suchat moved to Wat Nyana Sangwararam in Chonburi in 1984, and has resided there until present. Prajan Suchat is the author of numerous Dhamma books, including Real Happiness, Sensual Pleasures Are Painful, and the autobiography, My Way. He now teaches internationally, both in Thai and English languages. So Tanajan, thank you so much for, for joining us today. You're welcome, and happy to be here. Yeah, thank you, Tanajan. Um, so maybe to begin with, uh, in reading your biography, I was learning when you stayed with Long Dhamma Habua, he would give very long Dhamma talks, maybe two hour long Dhamma talks. And I'm curious if you could talk about uh, how to listen to the Dhamma, what to do with your mind when hearing Dhamma. Well, we're just mindful of listening to his talk. Everybody will be sitting quietly as if nobody's there. Everybody is so quiet and we didn't have any electricity. So we just have a couple candles on the shrine in front of the Buddha Rupa as lighting. But we don't need any light really because we, we're using the light of Dhamma, which is the teaching of the Ajahn. He normally give us a, a formal one hour talk first. He will start with whatever he, he wants to talk. And then you're just usually about sila, the vinaya of the monks, how monks should uh, behave, and then do do tanga practice. And then you will go into the detail of the practicing of mindfulness, samadhi, and wisdom eventually. And that will be about one hour or so, more or less. Then you will take a break for tanajan panya vato which is an English monk, have a chance to give a recap in English to a few Western monks who were there, maybe about 10 minutes or so. During that time, we just sit down and wait and Tanajan take a break and have his drink of water and chew some betel nuts. And then when Tanvanya was done, then Tanajan would then talk informally just like talking to you right now about his practices at various times and his experiences with Tanajanman and so forth. And to about maybe for another hour or so, it will be about two hours. Then we will then just disperse and go back to our kutis and do more practices. Because usually after we listen to his Dhamma talk, we got more inspiration, mm -hmm. more energy to do the practice. Mm -hmm. Before listening to the Dhamma talk, we are just about out of energy. So when we listen to his talk, somehow it revitalizes our spirit and make us have the energy to continue on practicing for a few hours more. So this is, and normally when I first went there, he gave about a talk once every five or six days. Mm -hmm. That's when, that was the time when he, 
he wasn't involved much with the lay people yet. Mm. And his hell was in in ship shape. So he could call a meeting. But he won't tell you in advance when the meeting's gonna be. Mm. So you have to be prepared. Usually it comes in the dust after sunset mm. when it begins to get dark. Then he'll send a mom to to go and tell us we're gonna have a meeting. Mm. And as soon as we heard the word, we have to run because we don't want him to wait for us. Mm. And when we got there, we you know, just place the, the sitting mat and so forth. And then just sit and wait until everybody's there, mm. which doesn't take too long because everybody more or less was anticipating the talk. Mm. And so when we were all there, then Tan Chan would then start talking. Tan Chan, when, when you would listen to his talks, I, I had read that you practiced a lot of uh, Budo mantra re recitation, Budo practice. When you would listen to his talks, would you recite your meditation or would you try to really be like thinking about what he's, he's saying? Or you have to think well, what he's saying, or at least pay attention to what he said. Not never use the mantra when you're listening to a Dhamma talk, okay. because it will be interfering. Okay. Because Dhamma talk is more precious than reciting Bhutto at that time. Wow. You can recite Bhutto while you're alone. <laughs> but when you're listening to Dhamma talk, you want to concentrate on listening to the Dhamma talk. Wow. Or else you won't understand what he was talking about. Tanajan, I've heard that Longtan Mahabhu's Dhamma talks, I believe Ajahn Panyavado is speaking to the fact that one's questions, or maybe it was Ajahn Dick, um, the actual content of the talk sometimes wasn't all that was relevant in, in that people could be listening and there was just a power in uh, Longtan Mahabhu's voice. And sometimes people's questions would be resolved just from listening to an hour um, can the voice of, of Dhammas um, speak in, in this way? It's not something we're familiar with in the West. And what, what are your thoughts on that quality of speaking Dhamma? I think it depends on each individual who listen, maybe have different effect on, upon them. But for me, it's the understanding of his talk that gives me the, the wisdom the insight as to what you need to do to be able to achieve the result from the practice. So for me, it's more the, the top, the, the content of the top, not the, not the power of the, the voice or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But maybe different people have different effect. Maybe it depends on the level of the, the practice or so. Some, if you're just there trying to develop mindfulness and samadhi, you might not need much to reason to, to understand because you want something to maybe push your mindfulness, push your mind to, to calm. But for, if you're on the level of understanding, you want to understand what the Dharma practice is about, then you need to listen and then think about what he said as he said so that you can see the picture and understand what you need to do in your practice. Tanajan, um, what was most meaningful to you in the figure of, of Long Tamahabu as a teacher? You know, what inspired faith in you at first and going forward and what kind of um, were the most meaningful qualities to you uh, about him as a, as a, a teacher? Well, to be honest, I didn't know him at the time of my ordination. Yeah. But then while I was staying at Wat and I met a few Westerners who, were, who went up and came back to Wat Bhat from Bata, Manta, and mentioned about Tanajan Mahabhu. Mm -hmm. And I got a chance to read the book by Tanajan Panyavato, Wisdom Develops Samadhi. So I can get some inkling of what the Ajahn Mahabhu was teaching us about. But previously I was dependent on the, on the teaching of the Buddha himself. I read the Satipatthana Sutta 
That's the sutta I used to be my manual of practice. Follow the development of mindfulness using the body, kayakata sati and anapanasati when sitting in meditation. So I didn't really know anything about the first Thai tradition at all. But I was just looking for a place to practice. I was practicing for about a year at home. And I found that I need to, to grow more and I need to, to go live in a monastery and become a monk. So I, I had to, first I ordained and then I started looking for a monastery and I found out the Thai tradition, first tradition and Ajahn Mahabhava, Alunta Mahabhava was somehow easily accessible for me at that time because of the recommendation of the, the monks who had been visited there. And they, reckon, they, told me, they told me how to get there. So I wrote a letter to Tanajan Panyamato and asked permission to go pay a visit, really. Because my goal was to look for a place to practice. I, I didn't want to be involved in any rituals or any chanting or any invitation and so forth. Just want to do the practice. I need a quiet place. I, as far as teacher, I wasn't that, that much uh, looking for because I thought I had a teacher from, from what I read from the sutta. I read just a few sutta, the first discourse, the Nama Jakapa Vatana Sutta, the Anathalakana Sutta, the Atitaya Sutta, and the Satipatthana Sutta. So that's, that's pretty much what I, I, I needed to guide me in my practice. So at that time, I was looking for a place to practice more than a teacher. But after having been there, I realized having a teacher is much more precious because there are lots of things, lots of ways of practice that isn't shown in the suttas. So like fasting and sitting for a long time to overcome your pain of your body. So this is something that you learn from the teacher. At the time I practice sitting all night, for instance, to endure the, the painful feeling of the body. And he also did a lot of fasting in, to, to stimulate his, his practice. And also living in the wild, alone in the wild. This is something that I, I haven't thought of before when I was practicing at home. So I get a lot of uh, precious uh, tips and, you know, from being with a teacher. And also the way he drives us to practice, to be mindful. Every time we are around him, we have to be very mindful because if we do something wrong, we could be corrected by the in front of everybody. That's which can be legendary. <laughs> yeah. So everybody's quite nervous or quite on on their toes when they are in front of him. Yeah. Can I try he, he, he meant well. He he didn't he didn't hurt or have any, you know, try to harm us or anything like that. How would you maintain inspiration if Lungta Mahabua was giving talks, say, every two weeks? How would you, or every week, how would you maintain your inspiration in between the talks? Well, by keep on practicing. Because as you practice and you start to realize the result of your practice, you become inspired. You become more convinced of the path. Besides that, I also have his books. I, can, I spend about one hour every day reading his, his, his books. I read almost all of his books. So I know pretty much what he was teaching. Every day I will be reading about one hour. And he, was, I, he wrote a book about the, the, the Patipata, which is the practices of the Ajahn Man's disciples. So there was a lot of tips in there as to what to do. 
So I, 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 I didn't really need to, to join a meeting really because I, I already had my own meeting with him every day <laughs> by reading his book. Tanachan, what do you recommend for uh, monks or for serious practitioners in terms of study? You were doing about an hour of studying the biography of the Kuba Ajahn or their, their teachings and also studying the sutras. Do you recommend that for uh, for anyone, or does it depend on the, the person? Well, I wouldn't say I would recommend it to anybody, but I think if you have good books, books that can guide you in your meditation, I think it's worthwhile to read them. And so I was fortunate to run into a Tan Mahabhu, so in my mind, I think he, he knows everything about the practice and everything he said or wrote in the books are very precious for me. It helped me, guide me in my practice, inspire me and keep me on, the, on track. Yeah. Because I was something already I was looking for is to concentrate all my effort on the practice of meditation. I don't want to get involved in any other extra, extra spiritual work like construction or doing any other type of work. Yeah. And I was fortunate to run into him because he, he wants most to meditate, to practice. And he tried to give all the other works to the minimum, which was very uh, good for me. I, this is, what, this is what, what I was looking for. So, and then I also have his books to read. So I, I, I get all, all, all the things I need, a place to practice, and uh, instruction as to how to do the proper practice. Tanajan, you speak about Long Tam Mahabua's, um, you know, how, how you feel like he, he had practiced um, through the whole scope of, of the practice. And I've been struck by the talks, many of which you've translated, and I've, I've listened to your translations of of Long Tam Mahabu is speaking about aspects of the mind and awakening that I've, I've never heard spoken to so clearly elsewhere. Um, and I remember specifically one instance where he talks about a state beyond space and time. And I, I wondered if you had any, you know, mo most Westerners, when they think of the word cessation or, you know, cooling, Nibbana, there's sort of this intuition of cold blankness I wonder what you would, how you would respond to a perception like that, and specifically in relationship to Long Tamahabu's own descriptions of of states that most of us have not had access to. Well, this is the state you access in your meditation, when your mind eventually enter into the fourth jhana. That's when your your thoughts stop functioning temporarily, and all that you have left is the emptiness of mental space, which comparable to the, the, the physical space when you're in space. When you, so you, when you're there, you will be all alone. All that is left is you or the knower. Actually, there's no you anymore because the you was the, was the mental fabrication. Once the mental fabrication stopped functioning, your thought and the you disappear. And all you have left is just the knower, knowing the emptiness and uh, the state of equanimity within the mind itself. So this is what you will experience when you eventually got to that point. How, how does one move from that to, to liberation? You don't, you, this is the, the, the end of meditation, really. This is what, the result that once you get, is to get calm, peacefulness, equanimity, and a sense of peace and happiness from this state, which the Buddha described as the, the, the happiness that arises from a calm mind, excels all, all types of happiness. Once you have this, then you have something to bargain with just your defilements. <laughs> your defilement wants to look for happiness, but it wants to look through the, 
sensual objects. But if you if you study the teaching, you realize that the sensual objects are all have the three characteristic as its character. It is dukkha because it's it's temporary, it's not permanent. You might enjoy a meal, but when, once it's gone, it's gone. And you're left hungry and empty again. And left you desiring for more. And when you can when you cannot get it, then you become unhappy. So this is the thing that you can down bargain and say, you don't need to have happiness and sensual objects anymore. All you have to do is go into jhana anytime you feel like you want to have happiness. But the only drawback about jhana is it's not permanent. You have to keep going back to get that happiness from peace of mind. And so if you want to have this type of happiness to be permanent, we need to develop vipassana or wisdom to eliminate the defilement, which are the ones that destroy the peace that we gain from, from jhana. Because when we come out jhana, when we start to think, the defilement will start coming up again. And it will eventually drag us to go look for something to see or to hear, to drink or to smell or so forth. Without even knowing it, you know, because we've been so used to looking for this type of happiness all the time. But once we have this happiness, the other type of happiness that we can experience from meditation, then we can then use the wisdom that Buddha teaches us to develop is to see the three characteristics in the objects that your defilement wants to have, that it is gonna hurt you sooner or later, it's gonna give you dukkha because of their temporary nature, uh, their uncertain nature, they keep constantly changing. From good can be bad, right? Same thing that you get, at first you get it, it's good, but then a few days later, it might break down, or, some, or, or you might lose it. You know? So this is the nature of things that we want to teach the mind every time we desire or crave for them. And they are temporarily happiness, because they are not, they keep changing and they are not under your control, right? Ananta, not under your control. You cannot say, this thing gonna be like this all the time. Because it can change or it can disappear anytime without any warning. So this is one you teach your mind to, to see so that what you crave for will not, it's not real happiness. It's real dukkha without knowing it. It's dukkha in disguise yeah. and a form of happiness, of pleasure. They're like drugs, you know, people have got addicted to drugs. They thought, oh, this is pleasure, right? To smoke a joint or to, <laughs> to take some whatever pills they have. You're high, you're high for a few hours. And then after that, the effect of the drugs disappear. And then you back down and then you feel lonely and feel sad and feel the desire to need to go back up again. And so you can become addicted. And then anytime when you cannot get what you're addicted to, then you, what you get, you get dukkha, suffering. So everything is like this. This is what you want to teach your mind. Tanajan, how would one know the difference between, say, a refined brightness like fourth jhana and the state of full awakening? Well, awakening is something when you when you come out of dukkha see, with wisdom. When you are like when you're sitting and your body becomes so painful and your mind becomes so miserable from the pain. But as you apply wisdom and see that the pain is uh, anicca, impermanent, sanatta, something you cannot control or force it. So the only thing you can do is to, to live with it, to leave it alone. See, when you see, when your mind eventually let go of your attachment to 
the pain or the, your desire of wanting to get rid of the pain has subsided. Then your mind become peaceful and happy. That's awakening. See? Dukkha disappear. You see the four noble truths within yourself. See, dukkha arise from your cravings for the pain to disappear. But as you apply wisdom to see that the pain is beyond your control, all you can do is to leave it alone. Once you your mind be let, let go and leave the pain alone, then your mind has cessation, has nirvana. The, the dukkha that arises in the mind disappear. Not the, not the dukkha in the body, not the pain in the body. The pain in the body can still remain there, but it doesn't affect the body, not the, doesn't affect the mind anymore. The mind can live, coexist with the pain of the body. That's what awakening is. You have to see the Four Noble Truths. In this sense, I'm giving you an, an example of the painful feeling of your body. 